In many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, the social and economic role of women continues to be underestimated. Despite commitments to allocate more resources towards women in the region, many countries are still failing to make sufficient progress in protecting girls and women against preventable illness, death and the cycle of disempowerment. For millennia, African women have been the mainstay of families and communities, often in the face of extreme adversity. Despite their low social status and their unequal share of the burden of disease and death, they continue to be peacemakers, life givers, entrepreneurs and providers of care for children, the builders of Africa's future. We are used to women taking care of the children, of the family, of mother, father, um, husband, partner. So suddenly if you, the woman, become self-conscious and you, you want to go to the hospital to check out if you're okay, you want to go for regular checkup every year, it's seen as you, you're being selfish. At a time when governments face significant financial pressures, how can all parties be encouraged to take action and make permanent sustainable changes in order to reverse the huge underinvestment in women? The sub-Saharan African experience suggests that economic prosperity must first grow before adequate investment in women can occur. But how might things change if this thinking were reversed? If it is proved that investing in women first would achieve the very economic prosperity that many countries in the region seek, how differently might resources be allocated? Let's look at maternal mortality one of the many challenges in the sub-Saharan African region. In the Western world, a woman's lifetime chance of dying in childbirth is 1 in 2,900. An African woman in sub-Saharan Africa has a 1 in 42 lifetime chance of dying in childbirth. And those who survive are vulnerable to temporary or permanent disability. If policymakers could allocate enough resources to reduce maternal mortality by just 10%, what difference would that make to productivity and economic development? It was a very serious thing that happened to me. I didn't know its seriousness until a friend of mine called me from the Kolibu hospital and told me, Hey, Philo, are you alive? I said, ah. Well, what sort of question is this? So I asked him why that statement. And he said, what I went through, I would have died just like that. Yes. So it was later that I was realizing what I really went through. And if I, I've never stopped counting my blessings up till now. My last pregnancy, I had an earth topic which nearly, I nearly lost my life. But I thank God and the doctors who helped me through, through the operation, and I survived. I survived. As I lay bleeding, the lights went off in the hospital, and it took them some time to get the generator to work. I'm told again that at a point I didn't have a pulse, I didn't have a heart rate or anything. I was, you know, just lying there lifeless at that point. These are some of the lucky women who were able to access the right care at the right time. For many others, however, their stories do not have a happy ending. Maternal mortality does not occur in isolation. Instead, 
It is a consequence of a host of disadvantages affecting girls and women at each stage of their life course. Stage 1. A girl child. From the age of 4 onwards, girls are likely to be assigned day-to-day -day housework such as cleaning, washing, fetching of water and fuel, as well as preparing and cooking of food and trading in the markets. Stage 2. An adolescent girl. Should the mother become sick, it is common for girls to take on the responsibility of carer too, whilst boys of the same age are much more likely to be at school. It is also estimated that more than 92 million women, including 12 million girls between the ages of 10 and 14 years, live with the harmful effects of female genital mutilation, prevalent in many countries in the region, as well as sexually transmitted diseases from early sexual activity, early marriage and sexual violence. More than half of all maternal deaths occur in women between 16 and 19 and it is also this group that is the most affected by HIV AIDS which accounts for a third of deaths, particularly in areas of prolonged conflict. Attitudes towards contraception coupled with societal pressure to bear many children results in early pregnancies in young women. Carrying the burden of running the household, girls in the region are even less likely to progress in education, leaving them with little power to change their circumstances. Stage 3. An adult woman in the reproductive years. Particularly in rural areas, women struggle to assert control over their own health care needs or family planning. Those that can access health care often face prolonged travel, severe shortages of trained healthcare professionals and difficulties affording the drugs that they need. I wonder if I had, if I had died, what would have happened to my children? Yes, I look at them and I said, if I, I didn't know what would have happened to them. I don't know how I can take care of uh, three babies alone. Women form the majority of the agricultural workforce and account for nearly 80% of the food production of the continent, producing and preparing food and selling any surplus. They are also far more likely than men to allocate resources towards the care of their children. Maternal death resulting from poor obstetric and postnatal care is more likely in sub-Saharan Africa than anywhere else in the world. HIV-AIDS continues to be a problem as well as rape and violence, particularly in conflict regions where rape sometimes reaches epidemic proportions with multiple rape a sadly frequent feature. Stage 4. A woman beyond the reproductive years. Women who have survived beyond their reproductive years face the highest incidence in the world of cervical cancer as well as other life-threatening diseases. De nos jours, il n'y a pas, il n'y a pas beaucoup de femmes qui, qui se font, par exemple, dépister par rapport au cancer du, du col de l'utérus. Mais c'est un, un problème, mais ça tue. Lack of financial independence or pension schemes place an increased burden on other family members where elderly women also act as caregivers to AIDS orphans, their health becomes even more critical. So if resources were sufficiently allocated to reduce maternal mortality by just 10%, how would that affect productivity and economic development overall? In 2008, the sub-Saharan African region experienced a productivity loss of $5.4 billion due to maternal death alone. Even the crudest mathematics show that a 10% reduction in maternal death would result in a gain of approximately $500 million worth of productivity for the region each year. Let us understand the significance of an African mother and what her survival means to her family, community and to her country. Let's explore the following scenario. 
A mother is pregnant with her third child. She survives childbirth and is healthy. She continues to be the primary caregiver to her children and she and women like her continue to provide 80% of agricultural productivity and their families remain intact. Her daughters form part of the domestic workforce, increasing the family's productivity, but not to the exclusion of schooling. With education, the daughters are more likely to understand the benefits of family planning and protecting themselves against sexually transmitted diseases. They are also likely to assert more power over their own health needs, sexual activity and pregnancy. Their increased potential allows for labor-saving efficiencies, easing the domestic burden on the mother and themselves. And in return, the social and economic empowerment of her daughter provides her with greater security and comfort beyond her own working years. When grandchildren arrive, she can provide care for them in support of her daughter's economic activity, adding to the productivity, growth and development of an entire region. The World Health Organization calls for a multi-sectoral approach to maternal mortality. Such an approach includes improvements in obstetric and postnatal care and improved access to education. The socio-economic benefit increases with each generation as the cycle of disempowerment changes to become the cycle of empowerment. If we have very few people pushing the country's economy, where can we get to? We need everybody to be involved. Of course, we can't wipe out poverty totally. We can't wipe out maternal mortality totally. But we can improve upon it. We can have more people joining uh, in pushing the wheel and we go faster. We need to educate our politicians. We need to hold them responsible. Et nous sommes passés d'un taux de mortalité maternelle de 486 pour 100 000 naissances vivantes en 1998 à 341 pour 100 000 naissances vivantes. Et ça, c'est d'une part lié aux, aux, aux efforts que le gouvernement a bien voulu faire pour améliorer la santé en pré-natal. Il y a la subvention des accouchements à 80% et la prise en charge des urgences obstétricales quand on sait que ce sont ces urgences qui font le lit de la mortalité maternelle. J'étais accoucheuse traditionnelle, mais je n'aide plus les femmes à accoucher à la maison mais je les accompagne jusqu'au centre médical. Avant, nous ne comprenions pas les dangers qui pouvaient se présenter dans ce que nous faisions. Mais maintenant, nous apprécions notre façon de faire. Éduquer une femme, éduquer une nation. Et pour ça, le papier de la femme est très important. The transition from the cycle of disempowerment towards the cycle of empowerment will require a broad range of issues to be addressed at government level. The African region of the World Health Organization recently appointed an expert commission of specialists from across the continent to review the current status of women's health care in Africa. This report has identified six clusters of interventions that, with the appropriate level of investment, can improve the lives of women in the African region. However, for the investment to bear fruit, it must be backed by political commitment and leadership, and the resources and support of many players, including governments, development partners, communities, and women themselves. One. Good governance and leadership to improve, promote, support and invest in women's health. 2. Policy and legislative initiatives to translate good governance and leadership into concrete action. 3. Multisectoral interventions needed to improve women's health. 4. Empowering girls and women to be effective agents of their own interests. 5. Improving the responsiveness of healthcare systems to address the health needs of women. 6. 
data collection for monitoring progress made towards achieving targets for girls' and women's health. So anything that can be done to enhance their health and well-being and to reduce their burden of pain, disability and disease is enormously worthwhile for them and their communities. We need to do something to bring about radical change and we need to do it now. That is why the World Health Organization has produced this major new report prepared by a panel of experts drawn from across the continent and making specific and actionable recommendations that can really make a difference to the lives of women in Africa. We ask policy makers, healthcare providers, medical professionals, partners and non-governmental organizations and all other concerned with the care of women to consider these recommendations seriously and to act on them without delay. In doing so, not only will they help to improve significantly the lives of women in Africa, but they will also enhance the prosperity of the whole region by ensuring that the economic and social contribution made by women, generally to the societies in which they live, can reach its full potential. Lo, 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 lo.